a man who's honest, personified, last name Babcock, first name Pete. Pete Babcock, welcome, my friend. <laughs> ah, Pete, how are you? Good to see you. You know, the only thing you need to improve on, Avi, is you got to come out of your shell a little bit, <laughs> and your introverted tendencies. You've got to, you've got to let those go, right? I'm working on it. I'm working yeah. on it. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I, but I don't want to keep you in suspense like a mid '90s episode of The X Files. So let's see those smiles as I welcome a legendary athlete and human being to this tournament. Last name Avery, first name Miles. Miles Avery, welcome to the TKN Celebrity Tournament, my friend. Avi, thank you, thank you. That was such a, uh, as everyone says, uh, an incredible introduction. You know, you forget about some of those things you you've done. You know, because you've been around so long. And and uh, for a highly intelligent, kind, down to earth human being and legend, last name Bischoff, first name Eric. Eric, welcome, my friend. I just experienced sympathy cardio. My heart rate's about 120 beats a minute just listening to that intro, brother. Oh, I don't know how you do it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, that was thank awesome. You, thank you. Last name, Fjord. First name, Grant. Grant Fjord, welcome to the Celebrity Tournament, my friend. Hey, thank you, Avi. I got to say, that's one of the better introductions I've ever had. I kind of like to steal that for a TV broadcast here. <laughs> no problem. There's no copyright on it, so it's all yours, my friend. But I'll Congratulations to everybody on a job well done as you continue to compete in the TKN debate tournament. Good luck, God bless. Look forward to hearing you. Are you gonna have your hands full tonight with a couple of Hall of Famers you're going against? And I wanna just wish you the best of luck. Miles, can you please describe a moment in your life where something or someone in particular kept you going, my friend? You know, the, the, the death of my mom and, uh, and, and that, and how my family certainly was there to, to pick me up. Moving on then to to college and uh, I chose a sport gymnastics that uh, I, I really wasn't good at, but this this thing gymnastics certainly got a hold of me, uh, not thinking I was any good. And there were so many great freshmen on, on that squad where I was and uh, I was and, and so ready to, to, to quit the sport. I didn't know how that was gonna impact me academically with, with going to school because, you know, I loved athletics and without athletics, I was, I was absolutely totally, totally lost. There are, are coaches, you know, in your life sometimes that, that do pick you up and, uh, and they're right. And I had one, you know, his name was Chris and he was an assistant coach at, at Temple University. And he certainly, um, you know, he picked me up and, and told me some things about myself that, that I didn't know what was there. And, uh, and, and he did that for me and, and certainly, you know, changed my life in terms of, you know, I was a business major in, in college and I certainly, you know, I, I buckled down in, in terms of the academics and I wanted to change my life and become a coach. You know, what he was saying, I'm saying, like, oh, this guy's blowing smoke. How could he tell me I'm going to be better than all of these other guys? And I worked hard and that's what he said it was going to take. And 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 I and I went on to do that. And I went on, obviously, to be, become a Hall of Fame coach. And, you know, you have to have people in your life that uh, that are there for you and can can see you through it and help you lo know even about things about yourself that you aren't even aware, so. And Eric, I'll ask you the same thing. Uh, whether it occurred during an, your adolescence or your adulthood, was there a point in your life where you felt like life was getting the best of you? And if so, can you please describe a moment in your life where something or someone in particular kept you going, my friend? Sometimes over the course of my life, I've become too comfortable taking risks, but I was always able to outperform bad choices. And no matter how bad I'd fall, I was always able to get up pretty quickly and dust it off like it never happened and just move on to the next project. And I made some bad decisions. I won't say a bad decision. I made a good decision during a bad time. I own my own television production company, was doing extremely well with my business partner. The business took a real hit. And my partner and I both decided, we saw the handwriting on the wall, that it was just time to shut it down and move it on and move on. And before I knew it, I was facing chapter 11 bankruptcy. And in that process of losing hope, my wife, who I've been married to now for over 40 years, she she knew me well enough to give me room. But all the while, she kept trying to convince me to learn how to be grateful. I was I was at a Comic Con. I was hosting a panel, and a young lady in the back, her name is Amanda, stood up. It was towards the end of the panel, and she told me this story about how her and her father, the only real time they had together, was on Monday nights, and. She was an only child. She would watch my show, Monday Nitro, every Monday night with her father. And that was their father-daughter time. Yeah, every time I tell the story, I start to cry. <laughs> For the first time, 
in my career, I realized that while I was chasing the buck, chasing the, you know, as much fame as I'm going to get in professional wrestling, I should say, it was the first time in my life that what I was doing for a living actually impacted people. And I've heard a million of st stories like that ever since. And that changed the way I looked at where I was at in that moment. I really owe it to that young lady, but she taught me how to be grateful for something that was right under my nose. And that changed everything. And I had a vice principal who kind of sat me down one day and tried to point out that sports wasn't everything, but if it was what I believed in, that that's a path I had to go down. I turned professional, things were the top of the world, all that good stuff. And then my father passed. I went down another road where with a little bit of addiction such, we had to have another heart to heart conversation. And I talked to Glenn Sather and we decided that I made a trip to Betty Ford, which probably one of the best things that happened in my life, where everything I had done, everything I'd gone through, excuse me. And, and that was the biggest thing. And that was the hardest thing is to look at yourself and realize that you had to find something that you loved. And I'd forgotten to love myself. The game of hockey is easy to love. I love that. I had to find a love for myself. And that's what turns everything, that turned everything around for me. Being comfortable with myself allows me to give back. And I think that's been the biggest thing. And that's, it's also the hardest thing. When he start, put your hands together for a wonderful, real, sincere human being. Last name, Henry. First name, Mark. Mark Henry, welcome again, my friend. My brother, listen, let's call Guinness and get that out of the way. No. Because, sir, you just broke the world record for the most rhymes with O. So, like, I told you that this show uh, should be on mainstream television because it's the only show that I've ever been a part of that I feel like is actually solving the world's problems through the fact that you have people that are experts. I guess on this particular one, I pick Eric, but all three just just blew me away. I mean, but I have to I have to side with you, Miss Avery, because Appreciate that it. where not only did it touch me the most, but I identify with it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eric Bischoff. If you could take one invention, idea, or concept from the 20th to 21st century of you back in time before the 20th century. What would it be and why, good sir? Babel, the online learning, education learning system. And we lived in a very you know, lower, lower middle class area where a lot of factory workers and people that worked on assembly line and things like that worked. And there were people, you know, there, there was the Italian part of our neighborhood. There was the Polish part of our neighborhood. And there was the black part of our neighborhood. And there, you know, but everybody got along. It, it, it was different. And I learned, I had friends whose parents didn't speak English. One of the things I, and I didn't know it as a kid, it's just the way I grew up, is that when you just get past the, your differences and don't let your differences immediately create fear, I think fear is based in ignorance. Racism is based in ignorance. And you become fearful of it because you don't understand it. It's the way our brains are wired, you know? Our brains have been wired evolutionary, from an evolutionary point of view, to recognize danger and fear and anything that you don't recognize you're not comfortable with is fear. Your brains were wired that way. And I think when you learn someone's language, the process of learning a language makes you interested in their culture. This language is a reflection of culture in many ways. And when you start learning about another culture, all of a sudden you start respecting it and appreciating it in a different way. And I think if people would spend more time learning each other's language, it would be kind of a door opener. It's a lot easier to become comfortable and you become less fearful and do less stupid shit. <laughs> right now. Yeah, and I love how Eric brought up the fact that despite the fact that there might have been diversity where you grew up in Detroit, uh, a lot of times the media doesn't really pick up on the fact that there are a, a sect group of people, majority of us here in the U.S., who do respect each other. No, well, the media understands that your brain is wired. You're going to pay more attention to things that scare you than you are to things that make you feel good. That's just a fact of life. And uh, you know what? I would take the Internet back. It just allows you to get that wealth of knowledge where you're not sitting watching a newscast. You're not stuck with somebody else's opinion. You can find your own research. You can find your own opinions. And it just allows you to learn on your own. 
take it, what I would take back is, is, you know, video historically, you know, what other way to, to, to know what happened than to see it. We don't have that videography that we, we should have or could have if we had video cameras back there telling us the story of, of history. If you could have that kind of footage that you could relate to and hear their stories and what life was like, you know? So uh, on this particular one, I think I'd go with Miles. It changes the dynamic in, in the decision that you make based on he said, she said. Yeah, so, what's the end of that? I, 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 would, I would go with the camera phone. I would go with video footage. At what at what point does working for a better life become an unhealthy obsession? Whenever you are ready, good sir. You know what? I think it becomes when it involved it envelops your whole life. That I was a hundred percent committed to being as good as I could be playing hockey, and anything outside of that at that time didn't matter. You got to look and smell the roses. I mean, you got to enjoy the walk, enjoy the time. And I wish I'd have taken more time. And yeah, I'd still like to have put 100% into the work. I ask Miles a question. It is different than the question I asked Grant and the one I will ask Eric. Miles, how can a single moment have the power uh, to change everything, good sir? And I was a business major in, in high school and I took that to college. And my total thought is I'm going to be a banker. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a vice president, president of a bank one day. And that was where I was driven academically when I when I got to college. I went to Temple University and I just walked past uh, the gymnastics gym um, and uh, and said, wow, I would I would love to do this sport. This sport, you know, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about gymnastics, but I, I just it always intrigued me. And and that moment in time uh, changed my whole life. Gymnastics has been such a blessing to me that um in, in, in every facet of my life, I, I can't turn without well, there's someone something about gymnastics that that there's a, a positive impact that I've made to see athletes that leave my program and come back because they've had a tremendous experience that I know I've I've done and I'm doing it the right way that for that moment in time. And I still remember that moment of just walking past the gym and say, wow, they have gymnastics. This is awesome. And walking in that gym and just turned my life around and now here i am a hall of fame coach a coach of olympic champion and um just by walking past the gym that day changed my life uh mr eric bischoff the question i have for you is it's five words how do you measure success one word freedom first to drive a nicer car i wanted a bigger house i wanted to take my kids on nicer vacations I want to do this, I want to, want to, want to, want to, want to, want to. And in the process of disciplining myself and learning, really, from the ground up, how to be grateful for the little things in life, all of a sudden, that crap didn't mean anything to me anymore. And once that didn't mean anything to me anymore, that meaning trying to keep up with everybody else or reaching some level of success that I thought was important, everything became easier and way more fun. But when I quit competing with whatever it is I was competing with and just learned how to be appreciative for what I had, I started feeling free in a way that I had never felt in my life. There was a point, was it Lucy's, where they would allow you to simply take your hand and reach into the register and grab as much change yeah, as you can? Yeah, that was my payday. And by the way, to answer your question, I go to Lucy's. My job when I was six, yeah, seven, eight years old right. was to pick up all the garbage. And, sure. and Lucy, her husband, Frank, would open up the cash register and I got one grab. <laughs> Whatever I could grab is what I got paid for that day. And I eventually figured out that going for dimes was better in the long run when you've got a small hand. <laughs> There's a science to it. I love it. Sometimes I feel like I, I overdid it um, in terms of preparation and trying to outwork people. So uh, this one, I'll go with Grant. So power, Mark, Mark. and freedom, I think, would be the one that I chose. That's why I went with Eric. Uh, guys, a quick question. You, you all had a lot of fun tonight, I hope. I had a blast with you guys. Absolutely. This yeah, most cool. definitely. A lot of fun. I, really, I wanna... really grateful for the opportunity to be here, especially with you three gentlemen. So impressed. Coach Avery, Grant Fuhrer, your story is amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great job, Avi. Thank you. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, did you have a nice time today? Did you have a nice uh, evening with us? I had a great time, Avi. Thank you so much. It, it's you're awesome. awesome much it's been a real pleasure i was i was excited when we first spoke and i know we had a little bit of a, a scheduling issue and i was in australia last week and blah 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 but i'm really okay. glad you had patience with me and 
and gave me this opportunity because it's really, really been fun. And uh, I look forward to doing it again soon.